Um, just a quick, uh, yes, we are times up. I get dobbed in for talking because I'm the native speaker and we're in a native environment, so um, uh, yes, I get to be the, the one. Um, imagine that uh, I came around to visit you in your office or something, and as I came in, someone else comes in and you just tell me, hey, look, Tim, I've got to go and uh, do something. I'll be back in five minutes. Make yourself at home. Now, if I was a polite sort of person, I would stand at the window and watch the trees um, wave and wait for you to come back. If I was a normal person, I might um, go and look at the books on your bookshelf. And then maybe after a few minutes, we'd, uh, you'd come back and I'd say, oh, wow, I haven't seen anybody who's read White Light by Rudy Rucker in the original for a long time. You must be a really interesting person. I've learned something about you. If I was a bit more of a rude person, I might notice there's a tear-stained love letter on your desk. There's a, um, some, like, uh, lots of tissues in the waste paper basket. I could learn all sorts of things about you by looking at the environment that you've impinged upon in a number of ways. Now, of course, this is not something that's new. People have been looking at the spaces as we inhabit them and what they say about who we are and what we're doing um, for a very long time. Uh, there's a, a lovely essay, which I've only read bits of, um, from 1994, his fellow Riggins, talks about the living room as a space where we create a projection to the outside world and also a projection to ourselves about who we want to be. We have the relics of, I don't know, the grand grandfather's binoculars from where he went and kept climbed a mountain in New Guinea or some like little uh, dainty doily from, from uh, some great Aunt Hilda. We also had the things that we want people to see, like here's an amazing piece of art that I collected somewhere hanging on the wall. So this is the living room as a, as a place that we exhibit and also live in and, and, and inhabit, and we can read a lot about what people are doing in there. The living room, though, is a very uh, public space, and this is the way that Riggins is talking about it, because it's created. We can imagine some sort of fuddy-duddy aunt and uncle who always have a very well-kept uh, lounge room that we come to visit them in, and we don't feel like they actually live there at all. Everything's so perfect that we know there's no real trace in there. Um, whereas real inhabited spaces have all sorts of other bits and pieces in there. And there's this uh, rather hilarious and easy to read pop psychology book from Sam Gosling um, talking about the same sort of thing of going into more inhabited spaces. And he started off looking at uh, bedrooms, going into looking at people's bedrooms and all sorts of other personal, semi-personal and semi-public spaces. And it sort of divides up, not only do we have these um, things that we project out, the, the, the great things that we'd like to talk about um, to other people, and also these things that we have for ourselves, these feeling regulators, this makes me feel good having this picture of, of me and my, my mother as we went and did something, something. But this behavioral residue is a very important part of it. All those little things like the tear-stained love letter or the, the tissues or the other bits and pieces that are lying around, the cigarettes that have just been smoked and then stubbed out because we're really trying to give up. So when we talk about a physical narrative, we're talking about trying to create a world like this, trying to say, okay, who's somebody that we're interested in, or a few people that we're interested in, some fictitious characters, if they lived in a space or did things in a space, inhabited it, how could we impinge their story into the space that you could come and explore it and find something out about them? And of course, for everybody, something's going to be different. When, when you come into somebody's room and I come into somebody's room, we're going to look at different things in their room and find different stories out about them that will begin to interrelate, we'll begin to realise that, yes, because of that Rudy Rucker book is one thing that I see, but you actually see the little tweezers for holding spliffs. We both know that they're, like, they're all like druggies from the 60s. It's like a bit of history that we recognise in different ways. So we talk about these spaces as like networks of, uh, of access, and the way that you come into a space, you see something, you then connect it to something else and something else and something else, and you begin to build up a story. So very much about a physical space, very much about this sort of this exploration of an emergent network of things that mean things and relate to other things, and you begin to build this story up, much in the way that a detective is meant to, at least, at least in all the Columbo movies or in um, what's this, Miss Maud or something, all those Agatha Christie novels, they come into some place where something's happened and they find all these clues and put together a complete narrative of what led up to that space. So this is what we mean by a physical narrative. A picture like this, if you came into a room with this in it, with two drunk out martini glasses, so that they weren't left in the middle, a couple of ashtrays, a half written letter or, a, or maybe a novel, the chair's not pushed all the way in, but it's not pushed all the way out, so someone left in a semi-orderly fashion, what might have happened in that space? There's all sorts of things just from a very small space like this. One of the things that got us very interested in this was a piece that we saw from Christoph Buchel. Some of you might have seen some of his pieces. They seem to be always quite different. 
called Shelter 2, where you really felt that you'd stumbled into a, a world of a, like on a, uh, a, like an, a colony of humans on another planet that had somehow gone wrong. And we, this was exhibited in Linz and um, in the Offen Kulturhaus. And uh, I saw it as a very direct piece of, of exhibition, which was quite lovely. Um, Andy, one of the uh, Time's Up people, had the amazing experience of we were doing a show in the same space, a, a little production, and he'd gone into one of the workrooms and opened the wrong door to get out and walked into this environment not knowing that it was an exhibition and actually thought there were people living inside this exhibition space in some sort of bunks that was piled up, ashtrays, balanced things, a cinema that was only this high, so you had to be a midget to get into it. He really did not know where he was in until he sort of worked out, yes, okay, it's an exhibition, that's okay, it's just a story. But it's a wonderfully intricate and complex story. Um, there's lots of other ways of thinking about what it is that we're trying to do. Um, we often think about it as theatre without actors. We've uh, had a lot of interactions with some theatre people in Vienna and by talking to them we sort of found out that what we've been doing over years before we started doing this has a lot to do with improvisational theatre in, in a number of ways and live action role playing games. So that's one way of thinking about this. Another way because of the way that film very much uses physical spaces but very specific angles. Um, We've got a, a, a film where there's just one frame. There's no actual action happening in the film. So you're exploring the stage of the film from a number of perspectives. So there's all sorts of different ways that we can talk about these things and connect them to other bits of work, which is some sort of research that we're doing. So maybe to put this in some context, go back to the sensory circus. I don't know, there's some of you will have seen bits of the sensory circus. It was, for instance, at AV06, uh, 06, yes, in, in Middlesbrough, um, and a number of other places and is basically one of a whole series of works that we've done. Very physical, about building a world. Lots of people go in there, they explore spaces, there's pneumatics, there's projections, there's bright lights, there's lots of big bits of steel. People go in there and sweat and actually interact with physical objects. So you've got um, things you're wobbling around on. And one of the ways of sort of explaining this, or people have explained it, is to um, talk about a world that you sort of get into and explore as, a, as some sort of scientist. Um, the idea being that we have these spaces which are filled with a bunch of things that are going on and things that you can interrelate, interrelate with and sort of work with and actually use your body. And by exploring this space, you're acting like a, uh, an anthropologist referred to this as proto-science. You're actually getting in there and exploring this on a, on a level like some sort of scientist before the scientific method existed. Uh, so yeah, this idea of these exploration narratives, people go into these worlds and one of the things that we actually found quite surprising is we had all these machines that did things and weird interactions and things that brought people together. They started making up amazing stories about what they were seeing in there and things that were actually wonderful science fiction and were better stories about the way things might work than we actually came up with and about the way the things really did work. It was about these building up connections, these relational why sort of, sort of why things fit together in these causal relationships rather than technical hows. Was it done in Max or in like hand-coded C or something like that? It doesn't matter. It was about the relationships that came up. And one of the interesting points that we like to think of it as well was that in the same way that, that all these sort of online uh, social software things help bring people together to interrelate in various ways, this was hardware that were bringing people who didn't really know each other together and they were actually working on things together through this hardware level, which is really quite nice. So this term social hardware, we sort of banded around a little bit. And that seemed to be interesting. So then a couple of years ago, we sort of got out of, we stopped being scientists because scientists explore real worlds, they go off and do strange things, and got more and more interested in these stories, or these narratives, actually bringing characters into these worlds, not just physical worlds to explore physics and nature and things. Um, and the first piece in this direction we did was called Domestic Bliss, happened in a very old building in Linz, and it was a, um, a building that was filled with a bunch of uh, various projects based around the history of this building, and we uh, designed this story that was then told to you in the space by a narrator on this old television about what was going on. And then as the story played out on the television, it started happening around you. The light started flickering when the lightning strikes came, it rained outside, um, you heard the rain, you heard the flashes, the flickering happened. Strangely enough, people actually did, went, did go and look for their umbrellas before they left, even though it was perfectly sunny weather when they got there and it wasn't gonna change. This was really quite an immersive experience. To the point when the killer actually came in and broke out of the story that was being told and attacked the narrator. And not only attacked the narrator who was in this fictitious extra room, but actually tried to get out. And you can see up here um, on this uh, situation with the television screen in the corner, there's this uh, cupboard that's been pushed up against the door. The cupboard actually starts rattling as the murderer is trying to get out. And people screamed quite scarily when they had this happen behind them and they sort of bolted from the room. 
So this was sort of a, uh, a quite nice sort of, you can think of this as like an extended cinema where the cinema's like coming out of the television and actually encompassing the entire space. It was quite, quite a nice thing to do. Then we did last year a piece called 20 Seconds into the Future. This was once again a, um, a fictional scientist who'd been investigating some mathematics and had worked out that it connected to some weird physics properties and then was investigating some, some things. This, was all, this is all like real science, real mathematics. Um, outside the university and come to the university and began to realise that there was some ways that time and the, the continuation of time was bound up in the mathematics he was doing. And so it sort of turned into this weird science fiction piece of, um, yes, with the magical, math, magical mathematical properties that I've got, I can actually go forward in time and find out whether I was right or wrong about my mathematical ideas. So this is a bit of a, like a section of the semantic network that we sort of put together to try and explain a bit about what it is that we were doing to ourselves. So we've got things like these, these blocks, like these papers and books on desks, talk about certain themes. How do these themes relate to other themes? Where are the access points? Like hyperbolic pong, the game that's mentioned up in the top corner, is a three-sided, so three-sided football might be a term for some of you. This is a three-sided pong game. And it actually played on a hyperbolic surface rather than a triangular Euclidean surface to get people thinking about non-Euclidean geometry, which is very much a part of this mathematics thing. So play was getting in there in games. And then people would go and explore this world. And as the story sort of worked out, they'd get down to the bottom where there was these time machines going on. We had a wonderful looking time machine in there. Because as we know, every time machine's got to have a little vortex in it and all sorts of things. And people came in and explored this world and got totally lost. Um, it was really quite sweet. They were expecting a dry presentation from some scientist from, uh, that didn't really exist. If you tried to Google him, you'd find out pretty quickly. It must be an artificial character. But then while they, as they got into their story, they started finding all sorts of wonderful little bits, letters from, from relatives, this photograph, and then this football team from somewhere in, in southern Africa. All these relationships to his possible history in Namibia, et cetera, et cetera. There was a large, complex story that you could uh, sort of build up to. And the way that we transported this was through the physical objects in the space. Um, and he was basically preparing to give a classical science communication talk. So there was like interactive computer exhibits and, and, and. Oh, just so you know, in the background is the time machine. Really, that should be completely obvious because anything with the three blinking lights on it and the vortex has to be a time machine, if anybody's watched any science fiction recently. Um, but the, these are some of the things that we had in there. There was a radio show, so a voice that everyone in Austria knows from uh, the serious national radio was doing a faked interview with a, uh, an independent scientist talking about independent research. We had all sorts of diagrams on the walls, a mathematical family tree talking about the transfer of ideas from generation to generation. In real time, you had things like the answering machine going off and messages being left. You had faxes coming in from a publishing house that was talking about uh, scientific credibility, um, all sorts of other bits and pieces that came in there. Uh, emails popping up on the screen that were giving you some ideas of some of the com uh, communication that he was involved in. We had all this like, background scientific information and a chair that you could quite carefully sit in and people actually did use the chair too much so we, um, we should have put in some more comfy reading chairs and actually investigated a lot of the background information in this story as well as all this personal stuff. Because one of the things about research, this was presented in a, in a research context, a research communication context, was a lot of the stories, the personal reasons for getting into various research topics aren't really talked about. So um, we tried to bring that into a certain amount, uh, to a higher amount. That was like a very important part of the story. So this has brought us to this situation now where, um, as Anna mentioned earlier, we've um, put together a, a consortium of, of friends and colleagues to do um, this thing that we call physical and alternative reality narratives, where we want to get into, explore these things on a bit more of a gritty, hands-on level, not just building them, but actually investigating them in various ways, uh, to find out the sort of things that we can do to, to make them better and more interesting. Um, one of the things, this is the, the picture that's not the official picture of the project because this is a, a film still that's not in the film of a, uh, an old Pasolini film, I believe, at a, at a Catter or something. Um, and it's actually not in the film as far as we can tell. And we're still puzzled about what's actually happening in this scene. And so for us, it remains one of these wonderful things of, okay, what might be going on? Um, for copyright reasons, we decided to make it up ourselves again. And we've, so this is uh, the Time's Up crew having exactly the same mysterious experience of trying to work out what's going wrong. And a couple of the things that we're getting out of, of with this physical and alternate reality narratives. One of the aspects we're interested in very much are these like alternate reality games with a much more narrative context. So this is something that we're working with with Foam very carefully. Foam are a wonderful group based in, in Brussels. 
there were sorts of interesting sort of very networked uh, projects and they're looking at a very sort of pan-European uh, gaming environment where you've got really things happening in a number of cities, a number of languages simultaneously networking quite nicely. Um, very much about these physical environments, I hope some of you, we hope that some of you will get down to see uh, the exhibition at the grey area and dig around in there. Um, we were glad last night to see that after the, at the opening people got in there and they were meant to leave after anywhere between 5 and 10, 15, 20 minutes maybe and um, they had to actually stop the next groups going in because no one wanted to leave. They were busy investigating things and getting lost in all the, the possibilities in this network of the story which was quite nice. Um, also interested in ways that we can talk about these things afterwards because they're all installations and they fit in there. Um, and lots of sort of yeah, other contexts of how to bring this stuff together. Is it theatre? Is it a game? Is it all these things that it might be? So physical narration is the place where we're talking about this. And um, just to let someone mention a quote earlier, so this is the, the buzzword that we're using at the moment because we don't want to talk about just stories that are real. We don't want to talk about just stories that are physical. We want to play with this like borderline. If you explore a world and you're not quite sure where the reality of your physical existence and what's going on stops and how much of it is real and how much of it is just playing around and make believe. And as adults, I think we do a lot, we do a lot too less of that. We've spent 15 years encouraging grown-ups and art lovers to, to play with, with, their, with their hands and their bodies. Um, now we'd like to get you all to do a little bit of make-believe. So thank you very much.